Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be in Matthew 9, Mark 5, and Luke 9. Now, we're just trying to keep up with Come Follow Me, but also follow Luke. So this gets a little bit challenging, but we're going to start with Jairus and his daughter. And then on the way to heal Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood touches the hem of his garment. Now, the reason I want to emphasize the beginning is in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. There's something said that President Howard W. Hunter really, really emphasized, and I want to focus on that. Verse 18, whilst he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler, his name is Jairus, and worshiped him, saying, now listen to this request, my daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Elder Howard W. Hunter, after quoting that from Jairus, says the following, These are not only the words of faith of a father torn with grief, but are also a reminder to us that whatever Jesus lays his hands upon lives. That's why I love that statement from Jairus so much. It's every one of us that have something that he needs to fix. You could say, my relationship with my child is even now dead. Or you could say, my faith, my hope, my membership in the church is even now dead. But come and lay thy hand upon her and she shall live. It applies to every one of those circumstances. Whatever in your life is dead. If you reached out to the great Redeemer, the resurrector of all dead things, he can heal it. That is the God that we worship. Come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. So Jesus stands up and goes with Jairus, and on his way, has an experience with a woman that is one of my absolute favorite miracles of the Savior. So on the way to see Jairus' daughter, we're going to pause on that conversation. Because on the way, a woman with an issue of blood comes up behind him and touches the hem of his garment. So let's talk about that woman. Luke's going to tell us that she has spent all her living on physicians. Neither could be healed of any of them. Mark's going to say it this way. She had suffered this issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. We have to understand the significance of her issue of blood and where she is in the law of Moses, her desperation. If we can understand what's happening, then we can understand the miracle and the lesson. One of the things we kind of have to acknowledge is the culture and the context of the people that lived during this time. And the people that lived during this time took the scriptures very seriously, and the 613 laws of Torah, as they're outlined, deal with all kinds of things, and one of those is fertility. So because of her condition being in a perpetual state of blood loss, according to the law of Moses, she has to be purified but she can't stay pure because it's constant and it doesn't cease. So she's in a perpetual state of uncleanliness. That's Leviticus 15, 19 through 33. So her condition was actually a physical problem, but it was also a social and religious problem. It's hitting on all these levels. You see, if she touched anyone or any person's clothing, she rendered that person ceremonially unclean for the rest of the day. That's coming out of Leviticus 15, 26 and 27. So because she rendered unclean anybody she touched, she should not have even been in this crowd when she comes to touch Jesus' robe. Many teachers in Jesus' day avoided touching women altogether, lest they become ceremonially unclean. 
So her condition was one of complete vulnerability. She's an outsider in every way. So what does that mean for her socially? She probably had never been married or she was divorced. I mean, she's in this state of isolation. So she really was marginal to Jewish society. She probably has to make a living on her own outside of society, and that's really hard. So in a lot of ways, this woman represents the most vulnerable in society and those that are outcasts. And this woman comes to him and she touches him. And we do read in the Greek that that dunamin comes out of him, and that is the word for power. The prophet Joseph Smith said that the virtue referred to here in the text is the spirit of life. And a man who exercises great faith in administering to the sick or blessing little children or confirming is liable to become weakened. That's a really interesting quote. And frankly, that does happen to Joseph Smith. He taught this after a specific situation where he became pale and lost strength after performing some healings. And so it suggests to us that physical exhaustion can be the result of exercising spiritual power. We see this in Joseph's life. So it's clear to me as I read the text that Jesus literally felt this power leave him. And I like how Joseph Smith kind of expands on that idea and helps to teach it. Now, in Luke's account, as soon as Jesus said, who touched me, it says, when all denied. Now, if he turned around the moment she touched him, she had to have been right there. Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And then all denied. I suspect that included her. I suspect her first reaction to who touched me or the first reaction to Bryce, can I talk to you? Can we talk about your life? I think I understand the emotion in her heart where she says, It wasn't me. I didn't touch you. Please, I'm not ready for a face-to-face. I don't want your full attention on me. Can you look at someone else? I heard of a young woman who was working through a serious repentance issue, was invited to attend the temple. And she said, I can't go to the temple. I'm not worthy. Well, we're not going in the temple. We're just going to walk around the grounds. And she said, I don't want to go. I don't want God to notice me. And I think that's the feeling we have. We're so worried about his disappointment. You know, that's an interesting catch because Mark doesn't give that account. But you're right. It's right there in Luke 8, 45. Jesus said, who touched me? And then it reads, when all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee. And thou sayest thou who touched me? It's almost like the disciples are like, Why are you asking this? Everyone's touching you. But this woman's touch was different. Yes. Now, back to Mark, verse 32. After he says, who touched me, he looked round about to see her. So here's how I see the situation. She touches him and feels the thrill of being cleansed. He turns around to face her and says, who touched me? And her first reaction was, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. And then verse 32 of Mark's account, he looked round about to see her. I think Jesus is staring at her. Jesus is staring at me saying, Bryce, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to have a personal conversation with you. I do notice you and I'm waiting for you to not be scared of me. I'm waiting to be invited in. When are you going to open up to me and drop the fear? When can we have that personal conversation, Bryce? Is it now or do I need to wait? I think he's staring at her, inviting her to have a connection with him. And I see that as him staring at me. Please open the door, Bryce. I know the house is a mess, and I know you're worried that I'm going to condemn and judge you, but I won't. Open the door. Let's have a conversation. You're so worried that I'm the Messiah you're afraid I might be, but can we have a conversation so that you can know which Messiah I am? And then verse 33, oh, how do I feel verse 33, but the woman 
fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. This is that moment when you turn around and you face Jesus with all the things I've done, but with all the hope that I have that he is the Messiah I want him to be. When I turn around and I say, Lord, I'm ready for the conversation, and we acknowledge all the truth, look at what he said. In one word, he is going to make very clear which Messiah he is. Is he the kind of Messiah that if I had an exchange with him, I would walk away shamed, embarrassed, knowing how disappointed he is in me? Is that the Messiah he is? Or is he the Messiah I'm hoping he is? He turns around, and when finally she says, I'm the one, and she tells him the truth, he utters one of the most powerful, beautiful, gentle words in Scripture. And you really don't need the rest of the sentence. You just need that one word. He says to her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. With all my soul, I witness to you that he is the Messiah you hope him to be. You can face him. You can open that door and let him in in the darkest, most embarrassing moments of your life. You can open that door at any moment, and he only wants to help, not to criticize, not to condemn, not to shame. He is not angry. He's not disappointed, but he certainly wants to help. My other example of this is the woman taken in adultery. He basically says, there's only one person in this crowd who qualifies to throw a stone at her, and I will not stone her. He finds himself alone with her, and he says, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She says, no man. And then he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The footnote in that verse in John chapter 8 says that she walked away glorifying God and believing on him. She had an exchange where her behavior was corrected. She was told very clearly that that behavior needs to change, and yet was not condemned. It is my witness to you that he is the Messiah we hope he is. And I can at any moment, with all my past and all my history and all my imperfections, face him, that fear she must have felt when he said, who touched me? The instant assumption that he's disappointed, he's upset, he's angry, dissipated the moment he said, daughter, of that Messiah, I stand as a witness and encourage you to fling that door open and let him in. Beautiful. So, Julie Smith wrote a great commentary called The Gospel According to Mark, published by BYU Studies. I highly recommend it. In her commentary, she talks about how this woman's condition is associated with Eve. She says, first, her condition of ceaseless bleeding is a magnification of the normal female condition. In some strains of Jewish thought, this condition was associated with Eve's sin, and it was thought that it would not occur in the age to come. Menstruation was also associated with sin in general, according to Lamentations 1 and Ezekiel 36. All of these associations serve to make the bleeding woman in the story the ideal narrative of a recreation of Eve in her fallen state. And so Julie Smith opens up the idea that this woman is helping us understand mortality, understand our condition with the Lord. And because she's in this perpetual state of bleeding, she is, in a way, an example 
of the fall taken to its ultimate condition, a condition where we're completely helpless and we need to be redeemed. And so I like to look at this story through the lens of the fall, and I really appreciate Julie Smith's commentary here to help us see that this woman is all of us. We are all in a state of complete dependence, and we can't be saved on our own initiative. We need to take initiative but it's the Savior that can save us. And so there's so many parallels here. Like in the story of Adam and Eve, they've been cast out of the garden, and they're seeking spiritual healing. So both stories kind of involve people seeking healing and restoration and a willingness to reach out to a higher power for help. Also, both stories really do illustrate this idea that it's through our struggles and our hardships that we come to like a greater understanding of ourselves, who we are, and our relationship with God. Also, both stories, after the transgressive touch, the women hide from the divine presence in both stories. And then in both stories, the woman is questioned about her behavior. In the garden, God asks whether Eve has eaten, and here Jesus asked who touched him. But the difference in this story Remember, in the fall, when Eve is questioned, she blames the serpent. But here, this pattern of avoiding responsibility by blaming others ends. You see, in contrast, the bleeding woman tells the truth when she's questioned, and the difference between the two texts is significant because it shows that this time, this woman representing Eve in in her role here as the bleeding woman, as she takes complete responsibility, in the terms of the narrative, it shifts, and now Jesus is going to call her daughter. And so I really like that as kind of an overview of the connection between this woman and us, typologically as Adam and Eve. We are all Adam and Eve. That's one of the things I really do believe. When we read the story of Adam and Eve, it's the story of us. And so I like how at the end, how Bryce talked about how he calls her daughter, and this is an interesting parallel because in the story of the fall, it ends with serious consequences and curses. And yet in the gospel narrative, at least in Mark's story, it ends with a blessing of go in peace. And so this time, as Julie Smith comments, she says, the story is set to rights, largely through the person of Jesus. Her curse, at least this woman who comes and touches him, her curse was a symbol of identification with Eve and with sin, but it is now gone. Peace is the inversion of the enmity with Satan. Julie Smith also writes, she says, in both stories, the focus of the passage is on the consequence of the woman's actions. But whereas Eve's choice to touch resulted in her separation from God, the bleeding woman's touch resulted in her communion with Jesus and acceptance as his daughter. One of the things that is redeemed in this story is the story of the woman's initiative. You see, in the fall, the woman's initiative seems to be denigrated, at least in some texts, and at least as I've read Christian tradition, she's denigrated. But in this story, this woman who's kind of in that space, she's fallen, she takes initiative, and the story is redeemed. She's blessed, and she's called a daughter. So I really like this on many levels, And I do see all of us as sons and daughters of God in this state of complete vulnerability. We're on the outside. None of us are pure. None of us can be clean without Jesus, and we desperately need that touch. So do you sense the desperation that she has? This 12-year problem, and she's done everything that she can to solve it, and it's gotten worse. This woman is desperate. And then she hears about Jesus, and the thought occurs to her that he can heal her. And there's a message to all of us. When the doctors of the world don't help, he can heal you. So she thinks to herself, if I can simply go and touch the hem of his garment. Now, think about that. She doesn't want to necessarily touch Jesus. If she touches Jesus under the laws of Moses, she harms him. She makes him unclean. He now has to be ceremonially cleansed. And so she doesn't want to touch him. So she thinks to herself, I can just touch the hem of his garment. So technically, I haven't touched him, and I can receive a blessing. Now, I don't know exactly what she went through, so allow me to just personify it on me and so many people that I love and that I have taught. I think what she really wants to do is to just not bother Jesus. 
Now, if you go to your Bible dictionary, you can look up hem of garment, which says an important part of an Israelite's dress owning to the regulations in Numbers. It was really a tassel at each wing or corner or mantle, and the law required that it should be bound with a blue thread, the color of heaven. It would be the tassel that hung over the shoulder at the back that the woman with the issue of blood came and touched. Yeah. Julie Smith highlights this, and she says, Mark's story, his account, highlights the fact that the woman's touch was unique, distinct from all other touches of the crowd, and thus worthy of comment from Jesus. Her touch parallels Eve's touch, which most likely led to unique consequences and similarly ushered in death. Because the bleeding woman is most likely standing in this story, it is possible that she touches Jesus' side or his ribs, or in the back she touches his ribs perhaps. While speculative, this would be another point of contact with the Genesis text and suggest her role as Eve, as a type. In this case, reestablishing contact with the source of her creation. You see, in both stories, the transgressive touch changes the nature of women's bodies. The touching or eating in the garden story passed along the contagion of sin and death to Adam. In this story, the woman should convey impurity to Jesus, but precisely the opposite is what happens. And so the point that Julie Smith is trying to make is this woman's touch can be paralleled with the story of Eve touching the fruit. Also, we have Eve coming out of the side of Adam. Now, I know it says rib in the King James, but that word in the Hebrew is side. So we have a side situation. We have Jesus, and she relates this as Jesus is the second Adam. You see, as Adam introduces the fall, Jesus introduces the redemption from the fall. So we have like this Adam-Eve symbolism happening here of this woman coming and touching Jesus, and then we're going to read in the account that dunamin comes out of Jesus, or the word is translated as virtue in the King James, but it's going to really should be rendered as power. As she touches him, there's this transfer of, I'm going to call it light or power that's going to come out of Jesus. And so it's an important image for us to consider. Now, I also note, and I acknowledge, there are beautiful images of the woman on the ground touching Touching the hem. We see that in some of the artistic representations of this, and that's beautiful. And at the end of the day, we don't know. But I'm kind of with Julie Smith. I kind of see this woman as approaching him. She's walking. I think she's kind of touching his side or his back. Now, that's significant to me. And so let me get back to that application and how it's like she wanted to just sneak up behind. That's where the tassel would have been. That's where the hem would have been. It would have been behind him. And so many of us don't want to burden Christ. And so can I just sneak up and grab a blessing from behind? And so she does that. She touches him. And just like Mike talked about, the power of his healing comes out and heals her. Mark's account says, straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Now, put yourself in that situation. Here is a woman who has struggled in isolation for 12 years. She can't be with loved ones. She can't touch them or else she'll make them unclean. She has lived a life of desperation trying to get this problem solved. And one touch of Jesus, and she knows she's healed. This is exactly what Jairus was talking about. Come and lay your hand upon her and she shall live. Now, can you imagine the emotion in her heart at that moment where she knew she was healed of that plague? Can you imagine the rejoicing and the celebration and the relief? Every one of us is hoping for that relief of pain. Every one of us is hoping to have this moment where a touch from Christ heals me and I am free. Yeah. Okay, with that, we're going to move to Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead. I'm just going to read this little bit right here on his name. It's kind of fun. Jairus, and it's spelled Jairus or Jairus in, in the English. In the Greek, it's Iairos, and Iairos is whom God enlightens, or it can be read as coming from the Hebrew of the verb light, 
and it's kind of like this third you, you add a yod to the front of it, so it's yair. He will enlighten, or he will bring light. So the way I kind of read this, Yairos or Jairus is bringing Jesus into his inner circle, and because he's doing it, he's bringing light into his home, to his daughter, to his wife, and to his community. Jesus is the source of light, but I think that the name of this individual that's coming to Jesus for healing and him asking Jesus for help is bringing light not only to his home, but to his community. And so as Jesus is approaching the house, we read this really interesting passage In Matthew 9, 23, we read this, when Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. And he said unto them, give place for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. And it really sounds strange to us in our modern culture, like why are there minstrels and people making a noise? And I really like how it's portrayed in the scriptures, but I really also like how it's portrayed in the popular show called The Chosen. It was common in the culture of Jesus' day that then when there was a death, that you would bring mourners to the house and they would mourn the loss of the individual, almost like professional mourners. And in the popular show, The Chosen, Jesus asks them to leave. You guys need to go. And I really like how it's portrayed because what I see Jesus doing is he's creating a space where the home can be quiet. And I see this a lot with missionaries. I remember being a missionary, being trained to do this. When you're about to sit down and talk about spiritual things, you want to have the TV shut off. And you invite everybody in and you want to create a space where it can be quiet and the spirit can be present. And I remember being trained as a missionary to do that. And at first it seemed a little bit different. Like, why can't we just teach? But then when I started teaching, I realized it, like it really does make a difference and it can really kind of interfere with the spirit, right? Yep. And so Jesus kind of excuses those individuals and they laugh at him. And now, now when it's quiet, then he comes into that space. And he's going to raise uh, the daughter from the dead. And I really like how it's portrayed in Mark 5. So go to Mark 5, 41. He took the damsel by the hand and he said unto her, Talita kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of age 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given to her to eat. And I really like that where he's concerned about her condition. How are you feeling? Let's get her something to eat. And when he heals her, it is noted that she is 12 years old. And some Jewish interpreters would sometimes link texts by a common word. It's called a light word in a lot of biblical scholarship or a theme word. And sometimes that theme word would be like a golden thread woven through the text. And so some do look at this as this girl being 12 years old, as being attached to that same time as the number of years the woman with the issue of blood had been ill. They look at that as a useful literary connection. Now, whether or not that's purposeful, like you can decide for yourself. But one thing we see here is that culturally in Jesus's day, it was appropriate for girls at this age to get married. So her rescue from death, in a way, opens up the gate for life, for her to have children, just as the healing of the woman with the issue of blood would open up the possibility for her to have children. So in both situations, both of these miracles, they have more to do with just healing, that with this healing comes the potential for life. And I love that. I see that as Jesus is the light and the life of the world. And he's not just fixing broken bodies, but he's opening up the gate for future lives, which brings me to section 132, where the Lord says, and this is eternal lives to know Jesus. I think it's beautiful. Now, the one thing I'd like to add, looking back on this story, knowing that Jesus raised her from the dead, I want to point out something that happened on the way. This is only in Mark and Luke's account. In Matthew's account, as soon as he's done with the woman with the issue of blood, he's in Jairus's house. But in Luke's account, that delay may have caused a problem because during that delay, someone comes to him and says, thy daughter is dead. 
Trouble not the master. Now, let me just point out what's happening. Jairus now has a hesitance after he's faced Christ and invited him. I think this is symbolic of the moment in all of our lives after we've approached Jesus and said, come and lay thy hands upon my family or come into my life and help me. And then on the way to the healing, we start to second guess and to doubt. There is a darkness that comes after light and spiritual experiences. This is what I call the third Nephi temptation. That when the great sign was given, do you remember how there would be people who began to question and to wonder and doubt? And so many people in my world who've had an experience with light, who've invited Jesus into their life, now they start turning and they say, oh, it's too late. Don't worry about it. Don't bother the master. He's really not going to come into my house and heal my daughter. And in that setting, Jesus says, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. In Mark's account, he says, be not afraid, only believe. How many times is the Savior going to say in his mortal ministry, be of good cheer, be of good comfort? I love this from Elder Holland. He said, The Lord has probably spoken enough comforting words to supply the whole universe, it would seem. And yet we see all around us unhappy Latter-day Saints, worried Latter-day Saints, and gloomy Latter-day Saints, into whose troubled hearts not one of these innumerable consoling words seems to be allowed to enter. In fact, I think some of us must have that remnant of Puritan heritage still with us that says it is somehow wrong to be comforted or helped, that we are supposed to be miserable about something. Consider, for example, the Savior's benediction upon his disciples, even as he moved toward the pain and agony of Gethsemane and Calvary. On that very night, the night of the greatest suffering that has ever taken place in the world or that will ever take place, the Savior said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I submit to you, that may be one of the Savior's commandments that is, even in the hearts of otherwise faithful Latter-day Saints, almost universally disobeyed. And yet I wonder whether our resistance to this invitation could be any more grievous to the Lord's merciful heart. I can tell you this as a parent, as concerned as I would be if somewhere in their lives one of my children were seriously troubled or unhappy or disobedient, nevertheless, I would be infinitely more devastated if I felt that at such a time that child could not trust me to help or thought his or her interest was unimportant to me or unsafe in my care. In that same spirit, I am convinced that none of us can appreciate how deeply it wounds the loving heart of the Savior of the world when he finds that his people do not feel confident in his care or secure in his hands or trust in his commandments. Just because God is God, just because Christ is Christ, they cannot do other than care for us and bless us, and help us if we will but come unto them, approaching their throne of grace in meekness and lowliness of heart. They can't help but bless us. They have to. It is in their nature. There is not a single loophole or curveball or open trench to fall into for the man or woman who walks the path that Christ walks. When he says, come, follow me, he means that he knows where the quicksand is and where the thorns are and the best way to handle the slippery slope near the summit of our personal mountains. He knows it all, and he knows the way. He is the way. I love that from Elder Holland. So take these two stories And don't be afraid to let Christ in from the very beginning. The woman with the issue of blood was fearing and trembling and nervous and doubted 
before a light experience happens. This is Joseph Smith in the Grove of Trees. Satan came and tried to stop the light from coming. And so this woman was hesitant before she faced Christ. But once you let him in and the doubts start to surface, hold on to the belief that you once had. Don't doubt before the light and don't doubt after the light. I think the fact that these two stories happen simultaneously is trying to convey that message. Be not afraid, only believe. That's what these two stories are trying to teach. Okay, with that, we're going to move to Luke 9, 1 through 6. This is also contained in Matthew 10 and Mark 6. This is the story of Jesus sending out the 12. Jesus gives the 12 apostles the authority over all devils. That's Luke 9, 1. He tells them to preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, and take nothing with them. That's Luke 9 and 2. In Matthew 10, verses 2 through 4, we get the list of of the names of the 12. Now the lists in Luke and Acts are going to replace Mark and Matthew Thaddeus with Judas, the son of James. You know, ancient documents show that it was common for people to go by more than one name. And so sometimes the different lists of apostles, you know, they may refer to the same people. I don't know, but just know that nicknames were common. Even on tomb inscriptions, people would have their nicknames or an alternate name inscribed on the tomb. And so I'm okay with that. But those are the names that are given in, in Matthew 10, 2 through 4. Now, also, if you're interested, we do some of the stuff in the show notes with the names of these individuals. We're not going to get into that here for this podcast, but there really are some interesting things to kind of look at when it comes to some of these individuals. But the main thing I think we're going to focus on here is what he tells them to do. And the way I read this, for years I read this and thought that Matthew 10 was a command for them to go out and preach later after Jesus dies and is resurrected. But I've kind of shifted my view. I look at this as Jesus is having them practice following him and doing what he does right in the middle of his mortal ministry. And I can imagine the look on their faces when they're sitting in a room and Jesus is looking at them and he says, now you're going to go do it. And the reason why I like that is because that's what we see in the restoration. We have individuals, and they're converted and they're baptized, and in the first few weeks of being a member, the Lord sends them on a mission. And I can only imagine how overwhelmed you would feel. Hey, go walk to the edge of civilization, and west of that line in Missouri, go to the Indian Territory, Ziba, Oliver, Parley, and go preach the gospel. And, and they hadn't grown up in the church. They didn't go to primary brand and new. primary songs. They didn't go through young men's organization. They didn't quote the young men's theme every single week. They didn't go to seminary. They are brand new. Oh. And the Lord says, go preach the gospel. <laughs> I would have felt so vulnerable. And then look what he tells him. Look in chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 7. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. In other words, you're going to be dependent on the people that you teach. And hey, don't worry about it you're going to be taken care of. This kind of harkens back to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, consider the lilies. Don't worry about clothes and food. I'll take care of you. That had to have taken great faith. He also gives this really interesting command. In Matthew 10, verse 5, we read, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. This is the only mention of Samaria and the Samaritans in Matthew's gospel. And its negative tone kind of suggests that this might be Matthew's view. Remember, Matthew, he's Jewish. He's writing to the Jews. There's a strong feeling of malcontent between the Jews and the Samaritans. I'm not sure. I, you know, I really don't know. But in his report of this experience, 
they're told not to go there. Now, the irony is, if you remember in John 4, we talked about Jesus teaching the woman at the well, and the entire city is converted to Jesus. And so I think there's some complexity here. And the way I'm going to see this is I'm going to see this kind of unfolding when we get to the book of Acts. So in Matthew 10, hey, don't go to the Samaritans. That's what we read in Matthew. But if you go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the resurrected Savior looks at them and says, speaking to the apostles, you shall have power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And the way I like to look at this is I see this as circles. Jerusalem is where he is, but then we're going to expand that circle to Judea and then expand it to our brothers and sisters of Samaria and then take it to the Gentiles. And that one verse in Acts chapter 1 encapsulates the entire book of Acts. We're going to get into this later when we do Acts, but we're going to see that Luke artfully shows that story the story of the concentric circles getting bigger. But for now, he's talking to his disciples. I think he's giving them this command to go on these mini missions, and we're just going to teach the Jews. I think that's how I read, don't go to anybody else but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So add the word yet. Don't go there yet. Yet. He will clearly add that later. But right now, let's not go there yet. I like that. Now, let me give you my list here. I think the obvious application of Matthew chapter 10 is those who go out on missions today. And I think there's some interesting statements. And if I were teaching a class of either pre-missionaries or maybe soon-to-be missionaries, I would, I would walk through some of these statements with them regarding what Jesus taught about missionaries. And I would begin in verse 8. One of the reasons the Savior gives that I should serve a mission and that every young man needs to understand. God put you on earth at a wonderful time, the fullness of the restoration. That's why a young man or a young woman should serve a mission. Freely, you have received. Now it's your turn to give. Isn't it interesting that we send out 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds, and then they basically tithe their life? They tithe the time that they've received and give that to the Lord. I have been given so much from the Lord. Allow me to pay a little bit of it back. Freely you have received, now freely give. Now, number two, in verse nine, he says, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Don't take a script. Don't take your coats. Don't take your shoes. And I look at that in our modern day as saying, leave the world behind. President Kimball gave a great talk to missionaries where he talked about, lock your heart. Go serve God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. Leave the world behind. Don't carry it with you so that you're constantly burdened by what's going on at home. Don't be hindered. Take no purse. Take no script. Leave the world behind. And as it says in section four, Serve God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. Now, number three, Jesus says in verse 14, Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Now, that phrase is found in many scriptures, including the doctrine and covenants. But the spirit of the scriptures seems to suggest this isn't a curse. Missionaries shouldn't be looking to curse people who don't believe them. That is not in harmony with the gospel. If I'm a missionary and I knock on a door and they reject me, I shouldn't be looking to curse them and shake off the dust as an impending curse that's coming upon that family. I read that plea a little differently. In the Book of Mormon, Jacob is given his assignment from the Lord. And so he goes out and preaches the gospel because he's received an assignment from the Lord. But then he says the following at the end of Jacob chapter 3. He says, we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon our own heads if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Wherefore, by laboring with our might, their blood might not come upon our garments 
Otherwise, their blood would come upon their garments, and we would not be found spotless at the last day. I think the spirit of what Jesus is trying to say is, don't give up on them. You have the responsibility to teach them. And only when you have done all that you can to teach them can you shake the blood off of your garments. Only if you have done all that you can. Therefore, I take the shaking of the dust off of the feet as not a cursing to the person who doesn't believe, but as an invitation to the missionary. I have done all that I can do to win your heart and to teach you the gospel. Therefore, I'm brushing my responsibility off. Your sins are now yours. But if I have not done that, I'm not giving up on you. I won't shake your responsibility off of me. That's how I read it. Now, one more on my list. In verse 8, 19, he says, Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. In the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord gives us a prerequisite, and I would emphasize this with all missionaries. I would make sure they understand that him opening my mouth and saying the right things depends on me doing something. In Doctrine and Covenants section 84, verse 85, he says, Neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, but treasure up in your minds continually the words of life. There's the prerequisite. And it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that shall be meted unto every man. So trust that the Lord will help you know what to say. But what you can do is to fill your mind with the gospel. Treasure up the words of eternal life. He will say this to Hiram Smith before it's time to go out preaching. And this is the message to missionaries before their call. He says to Hiram Smith in section 11, Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loose. See that prerequisite? Take your time before your mission to study the scriptures. Don't give your mission a last-minute thought. Oh, I'm going to go on a mission, and the Lord's going to tell me what to say. Seek to obtain his word, and then shall your tongue be loosed. And then, if you desire, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of men. So I would take some of these comments in Matthew chapter 10 and talk to young men and young women who are interested in serving a mission and point those comments out. You have so freely been blessed, you should consider giving, giving back to the Lord and going on a mission. Leave the world behind. Do everything you can to release yourself of the responsibility for the transgressions of other people. Make sure you teach them and do all that you can. And number four, treasure up the things of God long before it's time to go on a mission. Take seminary, go to institute, study the scriptures and come follow me. And then shall your tongue be loosed when you need it. That's how I would tackle Matthew chapter 10. So after the discussion with the 12 and sending them forth, we see in Luke chapter 9, verses 7 through 9, Herod is fearing that John is risen from the dead. Now, we're going to talk about John and his execution in a later podcast. But for now, just go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 7 reads, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, meaning Jesus, and he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead, and of some that Elias had appeared, and of others that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. Now, in the Mark account, in Mark 6, verse 14, Mark is going to call Herod a king. And my take on this, because he's not a king, he's a tetrarch, uh, I think that what Mark is doing is mocking Herod. I think Mark fully knows that Herod is not a king, and I think he's basically thumbing his nose at him because, at least according to the histories, 
That was a title that Herod wanted. It, he coveted that title, but he wasn't a king. And so in one sense of the word, by Mark calling him a king, he's kind of rubbing his nose in it. And I think that this is kind of what Scripture does sometimes, is it's an attack against their enemies. One of the things that some monarchs would call themselves was this title, the Son of God. And so in one sense, the gospel narratives themselves are basically saying to the world, your conception of God and our conception of God are diametrically opposed. Now, I don't think reincarnation is in view in this passage, but there were some Jews that did have this idea that perhaps there was a reincarnation. But John's return is said instead to be a rising from the dead, as a few persons had been raised at least through Old Testament prophets. Now, Elijah had never died, and many Jewish people anticipated his return. I think these verses in Luke 9, 7 through 9, are going to be a precursor to the discussion Jesus is going to have at Banias, or as it's called, Caesarea Philippi. That location is where Jesus is going to ask his disciples, and he's going to say, hey, who do people say that I am? And then finally, Peter who do you say that I am? I kind of see that those verses as a foreshadowing of that event. Which now, Luke presents in the same chapter. Luke will give Caesarea Philippi in chapter 9. Now, we're not going to cover it in chapter right. 9, but do you see that foreshadowing all within the same chapter? He's asking them, whom do men say that I yeah, am? Yeah, that's Luke 9, 18 through 21, where he asks them, hey, who do you guys think that I am? So with that, we're going to skip some of these verses in Luke 9, and we're going to go right to Luke 9.22. Don't we're, worry, those are better covered other places. We will cover them, but Luke gives a minor account, so we will cover them in, in other Come Follow Me podcasts where they are better covered. Exactly. Okay, so with that, go to Luke 9.22. He's talking about the Son of Man that must suffer and be rejected. And then he says, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gains the whole world and loses himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Now my reading of this is Jesus is saying in verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer, he must be rejected, and then notice what it says at the end of verse 22. He must be slain, and he must be raised on the third day. That's a clear teaching of Jesus' bodily resurrection. And then in the following verses, verses 23 through 27, Jesus is going to say, you guys got to follow me. And part of that includes taking up your cross, and then in verse 27, he seems to be hinting at this idea that there's going to be some individuals listening to his words that will see this. Now, I don't think he means see the resurrection. I think he means see the kingdom, meaning the political kingdom. And I think some of the Jews had this expectation that the messianic kingdom was coming, that Jesus was going to take the throne. So when Jesus is resurrected and he has a conversation with the apostles in Acts chapter 1, their question is essentially, Jesus, are you taking the throne? And then his message to them is, we're not doing that now. You go preach the kingdom, take the gospel to the world, and it seems like this is going to be after. And so in our vernacular as Latter-day Saints, we talk about the kingdom of God where Jesus takes the throne as millennial, last days, after he comes again. But we know that there were early Christians that did have this expectation that the resurrection and the second coming would happen in their day. We see some of that in the writings of Paul and later Christians. And we're going to look at that when we get into the epistles. If you're interested now and you want to kind of have a sneak peek at it, I'll just say this. It's in the show notes. You can go and read that. But that was an expectation that many of them had, and they would live to see it. The only way I see verse 27 of Luke 9 making sense 
is in connection with the end of the Gospel of John. And we'll talk about this more extensively when we get there, but just know that he's talking to Peter, and he tells him to feed my sheep, and he tells him this a few times. But then Peter, Peter turns about, and he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, so he's looking at him, and then in verse 21, it says, Peter, seeing him, meaning John, I think, says to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Now, if we read that in connection with the reference in 3 Nephi, where Jesus is talking to the three Nephites that are translated, and he says, you guys desire the same thing that my apostle John desired which is to be translated, to stay on the earth and not taste of death until I come again. If we read that in connection with those passages, then this verse in Luke 9, 27 begins to make sense. So here's what Elder McConkie says about this. He says, Our Lord said on one occasion that there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that's in Luke 9, 27, Mark 9, 1, and Matthew 16, 28. The Lord may have had reference to these or other translated persons when he said in March of 1831, all are under sin except those which I have reserved unto myself, holy men that ye know not of. That's DNC 49.8. In any event, John was translated, and then Elder McConkie cites John 21 that we've just read, also section 7 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And on the American continent, among the Nephites, three of the 12 were also given power over death so that they could continue their ministry until the second coming. And you can read about that in 3 Nephi 28. There are no other known instances of translation during the Christian era. Okay, that's Elder McConkie. So with that, the the meaning of Luke 9, 27 is that the sum standing here that will see the kingdom of God is a reference to John. But I also want to open up that possibility that that was an expectation of the early church. And ever since then, I believe that followers of Jesus have been anticipating that event, especially when there's times of political discontent or war or great tumult or persecution. There were many persecutions that the Christians underwent in the first few centuries when it was this small fledgling group and they were highly persecuted. You know that they probably had conversations around their meals where they said, Lord, just come. Please just come, let your kingdom come and thy will be done. And my prayer for all of us is that we can have the kingdom now in the sense that we're living the way that Jesus would have us live. And if we are, we can have peace in this world despite who's in charge politically or what the difficulties may be. Now, the next few stories that come up in Luke, we're going to save for their more full accounts in Matthew. So we won't talk about the Mount of Transfiguration today, nor the father that has a son possessed by a demon that they interact with after they come down from the mount. So now let's turn to the Savior's prophecy of his death. We read this in Luke 9, starting in verse 43. They were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, every one at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Now, that's in connection with that previous verse that we read earlier in Luke 9, 22, that the Son of Man will be rejected, and he will be slain, and he will be raised the third day. The gospel narratives agree that before the Lord's resurrection, the disciples didn't comprehend this doctrine. They understood that he would go to Jerusalem and that he would die, but they don't seem to have grasped what exactly would happen after that. And yet, after they received an outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and after they've seen the resurrected Jesus, it seems as if the apostles are seeing with new eyes. I think they didn't quite get it until it happened, and I think sometimes that's what Scripture does. I think sometimes Scripture opens up possibilities, and then when we see the prophecy fulfilled, we see it with new eyes. We kind of see this when Nephi talks about how to read Isaiah, 
and he talks about the people in our day are in a privileged position because many of Isaiah's prophecies are in the rearview window. We can see them in history. And so because we can see them because they've happened, a lot of times Isaiah is more plain unto us. I just want to bear witness of this idea that Jesus spoke of a literal resurrection, that he literally was resurrected. And I'm kind of reading this with the lens of the book of Alma, chapter 11, and my reading of that chapter tells me that this is a bodily resurrection, that we believe in an embodied God, and an embodied God that has a physical body opens up all kinds of possibilities about the nature of man, who we are relationships in the next life, marriage, everything. I mean, there's so much going on with divine embodiment, and I just want to testify of that. I believe that Jesus is saying to his apostles, and they're not getting it, but I believe what he's telling them is, you guys, I'm going to die, but three days later, I will be raised again, and so will you. You will one day be raised again. To me, that's important. So go down to verse 51. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans. One Bible scholar says this. He says, Galilean pilgrims to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. Remember, Galilee is to the north, so they're walking south. These pilgrims often took the short route right through Samaria although others took the long route around it. And we've kind of talked about that with John 4, how many would avoid Samaria because they're political enemies, political and religious enemies. The scholar continues, he says, but this verse seems to suggest that Jesus sought accommodations there, right there in Samaria, which would have offended many of the pious Pharisees and most of the Jewish nationalists. Even before John Hyrcanus, the Jewish king, had destroyed the Samaritan temple in the second century BC, Samaritans and Jews had detested one another's holy sites. The version that we have of the Samaritan Pentateuch specifies the proper site of worship as Mount Gerizim. You see, the Samaritans had a Pentateuch and the Jews had a Pentateuch, and the Jews' version hints that Deuteronomy 12, it doesn't say this, but it's hinting that the place where God shall choose to put his name is in Jerusalem. Well, in the Samaritan version of the same text, the place where God shall choose to put his name is in Mount Gerizim. That was their holy site. And so we have two groups that are reading basically the same scriptures that are completely opposed. Many Latter-day Saints can probably empathize with this position if you've ever had difficult conversations before with your friends that are not of our faith but are yet Christian. The scholar continues, Samaritans later tried to defile the Jerusalem temple, and Samaritans, seeing these Jews go from the south, would heckle the pilgrims that traveled to Jerusalem through their country, and this practice of heckling them occasionally led to violence. And so we just need to know that there were some pilgrims that did go through Samaria, and when they did, they were prepared to get heckled. So there's this enmity between these groups. And what does Jesus do? Of course, (laughs) he's like, we're going through Samaria. That's kind of setting the table for what we're reading here, isn't it? This is so applicable in our day. We live in a day where so many people are polarized and so many people throw darts at each other. And there's so many angry people and they say things that are offensive and other people are being offended. So common in our society to be offended. And they're offended for many reasons. And sometimes they're offended because other people deliberately intend to offend. And so in this society, in this commentary on a society that is both so quick to feel offended and so quick to do and say things that are clearly offensive to other people, it might be beneficial to hear how Jesus handles that. Now, I am not trying to condemn or criticize any specific group of people. I just want to put the Savior in front of you. How did Jesus handle a situation where he was being heckled, where he could very easily have been offended? How did he handle that situation? And we're going to jump out of this week's Come Follow Me just to show you the corollary. How did Jesus handle a situation where he could very easily have done something that would have offended others? He had every right to do it. 
but in doing it, he might offend some people. Let's start with the side of Jesus being heckled, where he could feel offended. Someone is very much doing something offensive to him, and he could run and get a lawyer and sue the pants off them. But instead, he chooses a different course. So here's the story. Let's pick it up where Mike left off. He entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. He needs a hotel room, and they won't give it to him. They know he's one of the Jews going down to Passover. And so verse 53, they will not receive him. Now, I know we have a lot of groups in our society who, so to speak, won't rent a hotel room to that group of people. I'm sorry, you got to find another room. Now, watch how James and John handle it. How dare you not rent us a hotel room? How dare you not do that for me when you do that for other people? That is inappropriate. And so James and John are angry. Now, notice their response in verse 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias or Elijah did? Now, that's the natural reaction, right? How dare you not rent me a hotel room? I want to cancel you. I'm going to get on social media, and I'm going to do all that I can to cancel you. It's a natural reaction. I'm going to call down fire from heaven and destroy you. But please hear what Jesus did. Instead of being offended, he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then I love this sentence. And they went to another village. Assuming that is a Samaritan village. They just found another hotel room. Now, I believe there's a balance in all things. I believe there is a time to stand up for truth and justice and being discriminated. But maybe we shouldn't be so quick to be offended, even when offense is intended. Maybe we should be more like the Savior and just not have that spirit in our hearts, the spirit of canceling them, of destroying them of pouring down fire from heaven to consume them. Maybe we should just go to another village. Now, to be complete, let's flip it to the other side. What would Jesus do in a situation where he could hold to his personal rights but might offend someone else? Now, that's Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 24. When they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money. Now, this is not a tax to Rome. This is a temple tax. They that received donations for the temple came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Peter, always wanting to defend Jesus, kind of defiantly says, Yes, he pays the temple tax. And then when they were coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, pulled him aside and said, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or strangers? Do kings tax their children or strangers? Well, the answer is obvious. Kings don't tax their children. They tax the rest of the community. So Peter answers appropriately, of strangers. Jesus said unto him, then are the children free. Now, do you see what he was saying? This is my house. This is my father's house. Should I pay tribute for my own house? And the answer was, I don't have to. Jesus did not have to pay the tribute. It was his house. He doesn't have to. Now, he could very easily have said, I don't have to, and I'm not going to. I have a right. And he would hold very tightly to my personal right. 
and I'm not going to pay the tax. I'm not going to pay the tribute. However, listen to what he said. He said, then are the children free, notwithstanding. Oh, how we need more notwithstanding moments in our lives. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Go pay the tribute money, Peter. Go down, catch a fish. In the mouth of that fish will be a coin and pay the tribute for you and for me. Lest we should offend them. Now, again, I understand there's a balance in all things. And sometimes there is a a right time to stand up for a right that's being infringed. But maybe we ought to rethink that sometimes. Maybe the right thing to do is to not offend. Jesus said, I have every right in the world to not have to pay this tax. But lest we should offend, let's go ahead and do it. Sometimes, for the good of our society, we should just pay the tribute, even though I have a personal right that I don't have to. May we find that balance. May Jesus help us find the balance of when do we stand up and hold to a right When do we stand up and correct a wrong that's being done to us? Those are important moments. But I would invite our whole society that is so quick to offend and so quick to be offended to examine these verses from the master where he chose not to be offended when he could easily have been offended. He did not call down fire from heaven to consume. He just went to another village. And when he had every right to hold to his personal rights, he chose not to, lest we offend. He didn't forego any rights he had by paying the tribute. May we find that gentle balance. May we understand that we live in a society with other of Heavenly Father's children. May we live like Christ. May we find peace in Christ. May you find courage this week to open the door and let him in, knowing that he will say to you, daughter or son. And so with that, we end our podcast today. We thank you for listening. We will see you next week when we cover Matthew 11 and 12 and Luke 11. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.